Okay, so we have a new episode of Legends and Leaders, and today it's great to have Amanda here. Um, Amanda, yo, you're the pre president of Fairchild Media, overseeing some of the most uh, reputable and well-respected um, media outlets in all of fashion. And you've had so much experience in fashion and, and even just luxury and media for years. I mean, you've been at virtually every single publication there is and been you know, crucial and instrumental in leading some of these. You know, With the Wall Street Journal, you were instrumental in growing um, growing overall, overall revenue there. Fast Company had one of its best um, ad sales years it ever had when you were at the company. So you really have mastered and, um, and been able to figure out how to grow publications, especially even now in, in an age with the internet, um, where it's very much changed. So I'm excited to have you here and to get into your story. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be even thought of to be part of a legends and leaders conversation. So I really appreciate that. I, I uh, hope I can live up to some kind of legendary conversation today. <laughs> That's the goal. So Amanda, where did your passion for media and news and, um, and even leadership, where did that come from? Was it something that you always had as a kid? Did you think that this would be the avenue you would go in? How did this arise? You know what? My uh, my dad worked in media, actually. He was the publisher and editor of a business magazine in Minneapolis, a really small magazine called um, Twin Cities Business. And he um, did a little bit of both, like the editing and reporting and and the selling. And I, and I didn't know that I would be as passionate about it as I am. I went to journalism school. I had my master's in journalism. And almost immediately upon getting out, I got a sales job. And I it's like the world changed for me. If you really enjoy selling and you enjoy that like solution oriented conversation, it really gels for you. And I like have been on this path ever since. So absolutely loved it. I got my first job at a regional city magazine and it was probably like a dream job in every way. But I realized if I didn't leave Minneapolis, I would never go or work anywhere else to move to New York fairly quickly after and really pushed myself to be part of some, to your point, some big brands and media moments and challenge myself continually within my career, which I will say I highly recommend doing um, for anybody who's like thinking about the job market or thinking about what they're passionate about or what they're good at. Absolutely continuing to push yourself is some of the best um, advice I can give. Mm, agreed. It's definitely a good way to be. Um, so earlier on, you started out with selling print and online ads, and um, you got really good at doing at doing that and determining what you know a client would want and giving them that type of value and building a recurring customer base. What do you think were the fundamentals of that sort of success and, and identifying what a client needed, the right type of, of offering to give them? How did you go about really structuring things correctly? Some of the best things you can do in, in a sales role is really listen. Like the temptation is to be the person who talks all the time and to say, I know, I know. But the reality is what you want, want is a relationship with your partner and client and ultimately to be able to deliver them the thing that they actually want that's going to hit the metrics that they have and be successful for them. So the more you can understand from the outset, what are those key performance indicators? What, how are they being measured? What do they consider success? What are programs that they've done or things that they've done in the past that have really worked? That's going to help you deliver everything that they want and make them look good. But the reality is with sales, and probably lots of people know this, is that there are bumps along the way, right? No moment is perfect. And so learning to navigate what happens when something goes off track or isn't exactly the way someone wants it and how you how you approach that with somebody is the fundamental difference between how you will be successful long term because if you can be a really good partner to somebody and be empathetic and have a solution or ideas of how to um, change or pivot or benefit them that's kind of the key to everything so i highly recommend mm -hmm. listening and then always being solution oriented with your partners Mm -hmm. So you, you were really involved in communications early on. I think you were in three or four different communications firms, uh, Bedford, MSP. Uh, how important do you think that uh, that, from, that like foundation was for you, Amanda? Because communications is such an important skill of being a leader. Right now, you're a leader of a media company. I mean, do you think that that really helped you understand communications by being so involved in that, in that space? Yeah, I do. You know, when you think about the basis of communication, like even if I didn't work in media today, I would say that skill, the writing, reading, how you get a message out is something that you can use anywhere. And probably like I wanted that foundation more in college on in order to um, be good at talking with partners and understanding what, what was happening in business. Like I really looked at it as, a, as like a life skill. 
You know, for me, um, learning that skill of writing, I think, has been super interesting. I'm probably, I'm not a journalist by by nature, obviously, but <laughs> having an understanding of how to write, and like how to get messages across and what, what do you want to say and what are the right nuances with some of the language, I think is incredibly important um, and really probably set me up and probably long term in my career. So having left those places and moved into the Wall Street Journal was a really big move for me. Um, I started in a luxury space in Wall Street, at the Wall Street Journal. We um, launched WSJ Magazine. I was part of the weekend edition launch and opening up kind of brand new categories. And, and within that too, learning how to communicate with people in a way that they want to be communicated with. So, you know, different brands or different categories of business want different things, whether it's something very literal and data oriented or if it's something more relationship oriented in the luxury space pivoting how I talk with somebody to the way they want to be talked to, I think is also a nice way of thinking about how to deliver for a partner, making their life easier. And, and that I think gets you a lot of things, even as a leader, right? Like I think about things that are important for me to communicate with my team. I want them to know the biggest things that we're doing and the goals that we have for the year and to be not only understanding what those things are, but to be totally aligned. I want them to be on board, have a crystal clear idea of what we're all working toward and to be engaged to know that they have a part in like a creative part in making that come to life. But how I communicate with them can be multiple ways. Some people want to hear it um, in a town hall or a big moment. Some people need to read the written version. Some people want to hear it um, and in one-on-one -on -one or smaller group conversations. So how we deliver that really has to be tailored for people. And, and that's true across all generations. So when you were at the Wall Street Journal, you, you grew revenue overall by 45% during about three and a half years that you were there. You, know, you mentioned the launch of the magazine. Um, there were some other new things I'm sure that you, you brought during that time. You know, what do you think was the largest contributor that you that you know you did that helped lead to this sort of success? And like, what do you think was missing beforehand that uh, didn't allow for this type of revenue growth? So the the revenue growth was phenomenal, and to me, I, I very much think that my skill set lies in um, sort of overall um, turnaround management. Like, I'm very good at turning mm -hmm. a business around. I'm very good at finding opportunity where there is none. I think at that point, the Wall Street Journal was very like this very well-known financial publication and and you knew that everybody on Wall Street read it. You knew it was the source of information for markets and world leaders. But probably what you didn't think of is that those people are inherently like high-end luxury consumers. And so when you think about looking at people in a different way or retelling a story and thinking like, wait a minute, this is how they approach their life and this is what this looks like. And you realize that there's another side or a duality to lots of people. So I think it's not, and and, and then ultimately the Wall Street Journal and WSA really leaned into that, right? Like they leaned in product wise, they leaned in, in terms of coverage. Um, so, you know, we got that part ultimately, but seeing the opportunity or like seeing the story of what someone's like and how to reach them in a different way has, has meant a path of success. And I think we've done that other places, right? I mean, it could have mm -hmm. been, you know, I went to the, I went to, I worked at Vogue in a very big digital transformation moment where there was um, first just the magazine and I, I shouldn't say just the magazine. It's, you know, the, the biggest, most well-known fashion magazine in the world. But ultimately we were launching a website and talking to people in a digital space. So thinking about who is a digital consumer and how do they consume media and what points of the day do they look at it, you know, helps to serve a conversation and a client ultimately. And a really interesting so, so there really wasn't this like expansion into like offering all these different types of luxury products at the Wall Street Journal at the time. Like what, what was it really like before? It was so interesting. And it too, it was a movement where at the Wall Street Journal and, and I like loved, loved, loved working at the journal. I considered like I met my husband there. I, I can't say enough. <laughs> I really I loved my time. I felt that I was mentored. I felt that I was mentored by like my bosses and the leaders there. I felt that they took the time to teach me things like, okay, this is how you might write this email, or you might think of things this way. or And I was given a lot of responsibility. And some of that responsibility is like some of the deal negotiation, or it can be, you know, how do you structure this deal that makes sense and can be interesting for your partners. Um, but it went from being a family-owned company during the time I was there to part of um, News Corp. And that was a really big moment in terms of transformation and, you know, the funds that they had, how they were approached in the world. And it was really going from being this business newspaper um, 
that's totally focused in finance into much bigger moments. Although we wrote out the 2008 kind of total market collapse, and that was not an easy moment for anybody. Um, so I, I can't say enough good things about having worked at the Wall Street Journal. Like I, I loved it. I, I consider them sort of family. I would say today, and maybe this is going like way off track, but I think news is like the most exciting place to work. And I, oh. I would consider Fairchild in that space. When you think about how people consume content, the, the most you can do to serve an audience is to co continually give new pieces of information. And the only players who are day-to-day -day equipped to do that are news organizations. People who have are chasing stories, breaking news, want to tell something that's first to market. And so that's where I feel among the areas I feel Fairchild stands out. So when I think about WWD breaking, breaking news in the fashion business, we stand out. We do 60 pieces of content a day. We do it every single day. We're competitive in every, in every way with the biggest media organizations and chasing exclusives. And that's the kind of thing that brings an audience in day after day or hour after hour in a really digital environment. And I would say the same about the Times and the Journal and other truly news organizations. Like I think those brands are best posed for success for the future because they have an inherent nature of pushing out really good content quickly. Mm -hmm. So today there's all this content creation. There's like been this wave of influencers that have come about and people have said, oh, they trust influencers because they're, you know, they're more relatable, this and that, you know, people have more reasons why they go over there. But how do you ensure that, you know, traditional media, which has wanted to be as, you know, really innovative can compete in that and even strive and be better um, in some ways than, you know, a, this kind of creator class? Is it just creating your own type of content in that avenue? Like how are some ways that you think that Fairchild is best positioned to do that? That's a really good question. I mean, I think the, the thing to think about the influencer economy is like how much they've done to change the scope of mm -hmm. what you put out and things that we consume on a day to day basis. And in a lot of ways, they replaced some of the magazines that we might have looked at historically. Like oh. that monthly magazine became an uh, hour to hour update in somebody's lives and how to find product and learn from it. And I think I have a lot of respect for the um, influencer community. I think the work they do is super interesting. I think it's additive. I think it brings communities together. So how I feel about the WWB or the Fairchild brands um, social media handles or how we approach things is a little different. Like one, I think we have, we have a, we have a different level of authority and different expectations, but I don't mm. think we're competing in content in the same way. So like, I'm not going to, or we aren't going to cover on a day-to-day -day basis, like, you know, a day in the life of an individual reporter or, um, you know, provide kind of really personal details about people's lives. Like we're approaching it as like, here's the news, here are things you can um, do. Like it could be like an activity, it could be a guide to a city, it could be, you know, codes to shop, et cetera. But like we can provide information, but it, in a very different way. Where I think we're keen to grow and we're very focused is in our own digital footprint. So we see this business audience as also consumers. And we really understand that, people who love fashion and beauty and footwear come to us because we know more about it than anybody else and that we're constantly updating that information. And so I want that message to also be able to live on all of our social platforms. And that's about the thing to learn from the influencer community is they understood where to, how, where and how to meet people where they want to be met. And so whether that's on TikTok, that's on Instagram, you find it on LinkedIn communities in the business in the business community, understanding how your audience wants to be talked to is something they did a phenomenal job with. And I think we can all learn from that and embrace it mm. and track it very closely. So we are keen to do more of that. And you'll see that with our own platforms. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the reason that Fairchild Media, you know, really liked you for the position of president, Amanda, was like your focus on not only the ability to turn around organizations, but it was also like the ability to execute well on live events and sponsorship for live events. And so you guys just did a recent event for Footwear News that was really well picked up. Um, what do you, you know, what do you hope to achieve in the live event space? And why is that so important? You would think there's only a limited amount of people that can be in a live event compared to what you can reach digitally. Why are live events so important to an organization like Fairchild? It's a great question. And, and you know, I think a core part of our business in every way. So you've got this great opportunity for digital audiences and you can connect with them in, in, in very real and very frequent ways. 
But the reality is that there are people, particularly coming out of the pandemic, who very much value an in-person connection. And it's something that we feel like we can't replace. It's this, it's the reason people still go on live meetings. It's the secret <laughs> reason people travel for work. Showing up and being there for somebody and getting to know them in a very personal live way, I think makes a really big jump in the relationship that you have with them. And I see that with partners and I see that in my own offices. Um, so Fairchild has 30 events planned this year. We are, <laughs> it's, it's a wild year for the full team and we are doing everything from CEO level summits to topical moments in sustainability activations at South by Southwest, um, a beauty events in LA, and then some global events that we have planned. And, and I think that's exactly the point. Like to me, bringing people together has been a standout. And I think mm -hmm. you will see more of that from us, not less of it. But what you have to do in those moments is you have to have a really good audience and you have to make sure that you're giving them what they want in terms of content and that you're bringing the right people together um, and continually, continually providing value. So for us, that means not only thinking about who we have as speakers, who we have as an audience, but also what is their interaction during that day and how do we evolve every experience that they have how do you change the lunch what's a better activation can should we bring in this type of person and how does that really reflect like who we are and the message we want to tell so i think it's a it's a big part of our business it continues to be important we feel it on a global level certainly we did an event last year um in october with the um, chinese-based retailer called skp they're a luxury mall operator and had a phenomenal experience. We hope we'll be back both in China and even in the, in the Middle East as well this year. Hmm. That, sound, that sounds great. 30 events. That's uh, quite a lot of, a lot you got to manage there. <laughs> yeah. I have a really good event team. They have, we have like a full-time staff. We have a production company we use. We have full-time speaker bookers. Like we are, um, the editors engage on it. Yeah. We've got a fully funded team for that. Make no mistake. And they are all busy. That's good to hear. So yeah. now we're kind of, Amanda, in this age of AI, right? AI has been around for some time, but it's kind of made certain breakthroughs recently. And, you know, news companies have almost been on a different, they've had a different opinion on some of the AI advancements because these companies have been training on public, you know, information and some of which, you know, your reporters and, and team has, has worked hard to be able to create and then they're just taking it for free, right? So what is kind of your, what is your approach and the Fairchild approach on um, what you think the, you know, improvements that AI can provide to you guys as an organization? And how do you also um, view some of these different companies and what they're doing? Do you think that it's positive that what they've done towards, towards journalism and how they've taken content and maybe made it more accessible for people, your work? Like, what are your thoughts on where AI is going and how it's being handled currently? It's a good question. I have, I have, I have a lot of thought and, and sort of diverse thoughts on it. And I, I would approach it like first from what's, how, how could one use it easily and what's good about it? So. I have talked to several partners in the retail space, and one interesting way you can easily use AI is in marketing subject lines for your e-blasts. And how do you come up with a witty headline about XYZ product? And that is something that AI can actually do for you. Or if you have a chat bot within your own um, site and that interacts with customers, that's an AI bot, and that's something that really works for you. And I think those kinds of things are really great. Where I think the rub is in the journalistic space, and you, you sort of brought this up, is if you're going to, if you are an AI company and you're going to scrape Fairchild sites for news and information and not acknowledge or pay us for that, it's a really difficult spot to be in. We fund our quality journalism and taking the information without giving us credit or payment is really an unfair way for us to proceed. And so we have both our own, you know, 100 plus year archive of information, whether that's images oh. or news. And I think looking at how you pay for journalism that you're taking and teaching the AI with is incredibly important and probably one of the biggest conversations that we're having. We are talking to to partners about how to work with them though. Like I think we're very much open to sharing and teaching an AI partner with the right payment structure about the history of fashion so that you can look at these things up or search an image base that could be, that is owned by us. And I think there are great possibilities there. So it's like, a, it's an interesting duality. Um, hmm. We 
do not allow reporters to use AI in their writing or reporting. Um, it is, we we do our own writing and editing. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is everything you put into AI and a kind of an open forum um, is then public, but it, it's also we want people to do their own writing and reporting and we think they're very skilled at it. So um, no, no cheating there, but an interesting mix of things. And I'm keen to see what happens in the future and some really great options for people. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see because it, it really went on journalism like right away, especially with these new these new innovations. So you would hope that they, that AI and journalism can be very much symbiotic and work together well um, as it all advances for sure. Yeah, I mean, even image searching, I think, is a super interesting way for people to interact, and you, you see that that's a great possibility. And so we just want to make sure that we continue this worth of journalism that we do, and that other brands who are in the same position can do the same. Yeah, I think it's a good way to look at it. So you guys are owned by the Penske Media Corporation. Um, you know, that's the owner currently. How do you think that they've been most beneficial for the growth of, you know, the different media outlets that you have? And, you know, what, what has been kind of some of the other types of benefits of having them be the owner that you've, you've experienced as being president? Um, Penske Media has been a phenomenal owner and partner for all of us. I mean, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, we are given this opportunity to run very special brands, or I am given with the entire team here, given the opportunity to run some very special brands, but with the full support and the full support and the experts at, at Penske Media. And so what you will find is um, support in digital and e-com and, you know, even in finance that are really there to make you bigger and smarter and better. I find the Penske Media team to be um, really innovative and obviously adding on new partners, which has opened up a huge opportunity for us. One example of that is you probably saw the Golden Globes, the Dick Clark owned or Penske Media owned um, collaboration. Well, WWD got a really great spot on the red carpet this year in collaboration mm. with Dick Clark production. And we were able to do our first ever live um, and pre-recorded social program around that. And I think that made a huge difference. Um, so I think you'll see more collaboration across the groups. I think it's a phenomenal company, great to work for, um, really allows people to run business, but helps support them in every way. And I, I think we're really lucky to have that. And, and I think what's interesting is you can see this across the brands, but there's a real support of quality content in journalism. And so they mm -hmm. value very much value the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and see the importance of it. And I feel like that's the heart of the organization as well. Mm -hmm. So Amanda, you know, because you're so involved in fashion journalism and, and media and really in that, in that area, I mean, you're so aware of a lot of these different trends and you can, you've probably seen patterns and trends, you know, cause you've been in the space for so much time. Like, where do you see the industry going? Like, and what do you, what would you say are some of the innovations that maybe you would like to see from fashion in general uh, that maybe you haven't been able to see yet? Um, you know, the fashion industry is super interesting and I, you do, we see like macro trends and micro trends all the time. And so those can be anything from like hemlines and color trends to shoulder trends, et cetera, or beauty trends or footwear trends. I think some of the more interesting things over the last couple of years that we've seen have been the sustainability movement. Um, the mm -hmm. look at quality over volume of purchasing, the equal right, equal treatment of rights for workers. Um, mm -hmm. I think you've seen this push in luxury sales and purchasing that really goes to show like a value of craftsmanship and heritage. And I see, you see that a lot of, out of the, a lot of European brands, you'll see it with the earnings numbers, whether it's Hermes or Brunello Cuccinelli. Um, this quality, like long-term work, I think is super interesting. Um, you know, I think we wanted to, we want to keep pushing the fashion business and the retail business in every way forward. And there's lots to be done at all points. Um, but very much excited about the industry, excited about everything that's happening. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're following closely. <laughs> so Amanda, just the last question that I have, you know, based on all the experiences you've had, you've been at so many different media companies and now, you know, as president of Fairchild with some of the most important, you know, outlets there are um, in this space. You know, what do you think, um, what, what do you hope to accomplish next, uh, you know, within the next five to 10 years, whether it's, you know, currently a fair child and also maybe on more of a personal level, some of the goals that you have, um, you know, in the next five to 10 years. 
Um, I have lots of ambitious goals. Listen, like I want, um, I want the Fairtall brands to grow exponentially over the next three years. And I, and I really see that in, 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 as possible. I'm looking at consumer content growth, whether it's a weekend product for WWD. I'm looking at digital growth with our own stories. I'm looking at event growth and looking at new pillars of things that we're doing. We have very ambitious plans and we have the ideation and the speed and the interest to do it. And I really think we will pull it off. In that time period, I hope like on a personal level, since it's it's January and we're thinking about our mm-hmm. for the year still or whatever, um, I, you know, I'm hoping I'll grow in my own role. I'm hoping I'll move into a CEO role. I want to be you know, bigger in the supporting female leaders within the industry and beyond. I want to do more in helping um, fashion students. I work on the board of the Fashion Scholarship Fund. We're having the students come into Fairchild and kind of do some experiential things with us um, in April, but I want to do more to help the community overall. Um, And so I guess I'm always striving to do a lot more to grow, but yes, my ambitious plans and maybe maybe sleep a little bit more or take a vacation here. (laughs) Yeah. Sounds good. Well, look, Amanda, I appreciate you coming on. I think you have a great story um, and you've really you know, been persistent for years and years and years, tried a lot of different avenues. And now, you know, the work you're doing at Fairchild is really important. And you've been taking those same skills that you've harnessed, you know, throughout time and of how to turn around organizations and how to really properly lead them and especially make them at the cutting edge of digital. Now, I'm sure you'll, you'll focus on you know, doing stuff like that with AI and other new technologies that will arise here. And I look forward to seeing the continued your continued growth and Fairchilds as well. So appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope I lived up to the title of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it.